Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from the King Edward Hotel in downtown Toronto. Welcome to the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you just joining us through either our webcast or our podcast, welcome to the meeting. Today, the Empire Club of Canada is welcoming the, welcoming the Consul General of Canada to Los Angeles. The Senior Representative for the Territory of Southern California, Arizona and Nevada, a territory that is immense. When you consider the role of the Consul General is to assist Canadians living abroad with Canadian government services, facilitating Americans looking to travel to Canada, and promote trade and business relationships in both countries. And in the new world of trade uncertainties, this has added to the challenge. And I'd like to welcome our American guests that are here with us today as well. Consul General, while preparing for this event, I found some interesting facts about your territories. More than 250,000 jobs in LA are supported by trade with Canada. And there are also over 300 Canadian-owned companies in California that em employ more than 34,000 people. It is true that LA has the largest amount of Canadians living there than anywhere else in the world. And in Las Vegas, 70% of all foreign visitors are Canadian. I hope no OLG people are in the room. These facts paint a picture of the tremendous responsibility of Mr. Villeneuve and why Canadians need to hear from him. It is important that he speaks to us today as a global leader. Some of, some of the value to the Canadians are his new business associations and new relationships which have happened on Mr. Villeneuve's watch. Today's topic, Toronto to LA and back, the big business of film and television is timely. In the midst of the 42nd Toronto International Film Festival, over the last 10 years, there have been more and more American productions filmed here in Canada. It's true that Ontario is a great place to do business with a supportive economic and tax landscape, not to mention our latest claim to fame, that our TV industry has produced the newest member of the royal family, Meghan Merkel. But much of this success has to do with the determination of our next guest. He is a global leader, he is a determined networker, an art that he has mastered long before his appointment to Los Angeles in 2014, but, no one, but nothing could be more important or useful in Tinseltown. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Villeneuve worked for Anheuser-Busch, InBev, the world's largest brewing company and the parent company of Labatt Breweries for more than 27 years. He started with Toronto working in sales over his Labatt's career. He worked his way up to become Vice President of Corporate Affairs in Canada. From 2007 to 2009, Mr. Villeneuve worked in Brussels to lead InBev's global corporate affairs practice. After InBev purchased Anheuser-Busch in 2009, Mr. Villeneuve moved to St. Louis to lead the company's North American corporate affairs practice. Mr. Villeneuve served on a number of boards during his career, including the Canadian Club and the 2008 Toronto Olympic bid. And I do understand also that he has a love of sports. So what I've gathered from your resume is that you are accomplished in beer, film, and sports. A career that many in this room would envy. Mr. Villeneuve is married to Kim Walker, who is here at the head table. Thank you. They have two children, Grace and Andrew. With that, I'd like you to give a warm welcome to our speaker today, Consul General James Villeneuve. Have fun. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, what a great honor to, to Mr. President, Speaker at the Empire Club. Uh, I've been to many of your events in the past, so to actually be up here speaking is just a great honor. And I also do want to thank uh, Kim, who's with me. When you get uh, an appointment in the Foreign Service, uh, believe me, she's a volunteer. I was getting paid, and it was a daily occurrence of people in and out of the lovely residence. For many of you, who've been there in Los Angeles, great place to host events. But as Kim described to me, James, it often feels like we're living above a banquet hall. <laughs> There's just people there. But just how I ended up in this role, I'll just tell you quickly, the second Obama inauguration, I was uh, invited to Gary Doerr's residence, who was our ambassador at the time in Washington. The Foreign Affairs Minister, John Baird, was there. Um, we had dinner, and I said to him that night, um, he, he said, what are you doing tonight? And I said, well, we're, I'm going out because I run the Government Affairs Department at the biggest brewery in the world. And why don't you come with me? Because you can come with me, or you can hang with the Canadian bureaucrats. Where do you think you're going to have more fun? <laughs> so he came with me. We went out and toured around. And during that course of that conversation, um, I knew we were going to finish up my beer career at the end of the year. He asked about uh, 
you know, somehow joining the Foreign Service. We didn't know when and where or how. Uh, ended up in Los Angeles. So it was a great thing, and um, it's been almost five years. We're coming to the end of the term, uh, my term, uh, at the end of November. So I'm just going to take you through um, a little bit of an overview of what I saw going into this. Um, and there's no doubt that uh, in TIFF, this is a big business. If, if you want to see people in LA, you're here now. Uh, it's a great time to meet people. It's obviously a big industry for Canada and a big industry for Ontario and for Toronto. Um, and the one unique thing we have on the ground is that we don't, we're the Canadians on the ground in Los Angeles. So I'm the senior government official there. We have a staff of people that work for us, but we're there. So we get to interact with people that are living and working there and the Canadians that come down. So today I'm just going to talk a bit about Toronto and or Canada going to LA, what that looks like, uh, and how we help that. And then the reverse coming up here and then just some of the challenges the industry is having or may have as we move forward. So just a little bit about, about Los Angeles. So I, if I say, what do you think of LA, you probably think this, right? Hollywood, we look at the sign every day from where Kim and I live. You might think of this. No, this is not the 401. Um, this is the 405 in Los Angeles. And yes, Los Angeles is a big city with a, a complicated place to move around. Everyone's in the rush. Everyone's pitching ideas. It's a constant beehive of business and activity. And it's a bit complicated at times um, to figure it out because people think it's Hollywood and that's it. But you probably don't know. Um, it's the largest manufacturing center in the United States to start with. So it has got people working in every asset, every business, you name it, in the place. And so part of what we do um, while we're dealing with the film and entertainment industry, we're dealing with multiple uh, different categories of people that want to do business in Canada. And I'll touch on a couple of them in a minute. It's also the largest port um, in North America and one of the biggest ports in the world, meaning it's a trading center. So things are coming in and out of there all the time, um, uh, which makes it a very vibrant place, but also makes it a place of global commerce. And it's also got 13 of 500, Fortune 500 companies based there, but only two are in the entertainment industry. And again, I'm framing this up for you just to understand that while film and entertainment is very important, there's just one piece of the puzzle. And this is, um, Kent touched on this, um, it is a global international city. And this, I, I used to go to LA a lot on business, and I never fully understood this to living there. Um, there are 75 consulates in, the, in Los Angeles, so it's the second largest consul, consulate center uh, in the United States behind only New York and Washington. They're about the same with LA, so meaning everybody's there. And it's got 20 of the world's largest di diasporas, so the Mexican consulate literally deals with hundreds of thousands of people to put it in perspective, but it ranges from them to all some of the ones I have listed there. And while we're trying to get attention in Los Angeles, all of these people are as well. Um, and, I, and we don't stand out. I, I like to joke with people. I said, we don't you know. How do you know a Canadian is down there? I said, well, you can probably figure it out if you go away on holidays and they take in your garbage pails and then they say they're sorry for doing it. <laughs> we're the nicest people there. Um, so the consulate itself, uh, there's 525 companies operating in LA. We have 55 staff. And the staff are, um, they range from uh, inter people that do trade, basically full-time trade officers, to consular officers, uh, to the RCMP are there. We have a whole political arm that's out interacting with the local politicians. And, you know, what, the embassy in Washington deals with, uh, with Washington. Uh, but we deal with the governors that are there, the local members of Congress, members of the Senate. And it's amazing how people progress through the food chain similar to what Canadian politics is like, people graduate on. So building the relationships with them is very important. And right now, it's more important than it's ever been. I, I get questions every single day from them, from both the Democrats and the Republicans on how do we play this? What do you want us to do? How do you see the world right now? So it's a, it's a complicated thing. And we spend you know, co copious amounts of time interacting with Ottawa and Washington on how to manage files right now. Um, just in terms of the entertainment industry, it's big in LA, right? So it's a $118 billion industry, uh, 140,000 jobs. It represents about 14% of the local economy. Um, but the one thing that it really does is it shapes global uh, perceptions of the United States, uh, film and television. People come there and they think that, you know, 
I saw this television movie about the United States or this film or whatever, and this is what it must be like. So, and when Mr. Jolie was down, she said to me, um, we were having a conversation, she said, who's the culture minister here in the United States? They don't really have one. I said, yes, they do. And there he is. <laughs> And, and I pull that up as an example of, um, or it might be these guys, um, as a second group of cultural ambassadors. I say that in that it's not a government supported or funded industry. It's an industry that creates global icons that get pushed out around the world that become representatives of America driven by business, which is a little bit different from what we do, but I just want to put that into context for people. Now, Canada down there. Canada's had a major, major role um, since the beginning of Hollywood. This is Mary Pickford. Um, she was one of the original silent film stars. There's actually a, a film academy named after her in Los Angeles. And as you probably know, Canadians have been coming forever to make their fortunes in film and television. And I put him down here because people think we, you know, if you're in a the Consul General LA, you must know all the stars. You just pick up the phone and call. Well, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, Although we do get the occasional one that comes by, <laughs> and another one. It's my look-alike. Um, and uh, now stars are great, but they really—they're um, pr part of the entertainment industry, and they have influence in LA. But it's much broader and deeper than that. That picture was actually last year uh, at our Emmy event, which we're actually hosting on Sunday, and we did it the day after the Emmys. And Jean-Marc Vallée, who's on the right, won for. Big Little Lies, and he brought Laura Dern with him, which was a great night for Canada that night. Um, talk about a company. Darren Troop is here with uh, the U1 team. Um, and I, I kind of watched this company grow up, and I know Darren, we spent a lot of personal time together, but in about 10 years, E1 has evolved into, from distributing movies into theaters, only in Canada, financing and producing films with TV to some of the biggest names in the business. And perhaps you recognize some of them. Here's one. You probably don't recognize this guy, uh, but I'm going to tell you who he is. Darren knows him. Uh, Mark Gordon, and one of the most successful producers in Hollywood, now one, and now E1's president and chief content officer, which was a huge coup for the company in terms of getting him. That was a, quite a noticed thing in Hollywood that he was coming to work for um, a Canadian company. Um, and, and E1 has great presence here in Toronto, but also great presence on the ground in Los Angeles. So it's a very good story. Um, and under Darren's leadership, the company's on track to hit their goals of doubling their earnings by 220. So again, and we've talked about this, about how Darren and others have to adjust in this industry. It's changing all the time. And those that can and lead through it can benefit from it and become true leaders as, as E1 has become. Another company, IMAX, Canadian-based, uh, headquarters in Mississauga. Uh, I've been to see them a few times in Los Angeles. Um, while global film is somewhat in decline, meaning people aren't necessarily going to theaters, IMAX is growing. So people are interested in sort of the experience of IMAX movies and what they mean, and they're, and they're expanding globally. Um, and, you know, as studios emphasize the big blockbusters, the IMAX experience becomes even more important uh, as a huge profit center. And they're increasingly global and have some um, uh, 1,300 screens in 50 to 80 different countries and, and huge growth in places like China. Braun, another Canadian company. Um, these guys are really neat. Braun Studios. They're in, uh, based in Vancouver and actually Burnaby. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter just said these are some of the people that can actually get um, uh, private movies um, funded and are independent movies made. And it's not easy to do, but these guys do. And um, in just over 10 years of ex existence, they've gone from a home office to 200 plus employees, again, by innovative, creative work that they've done. They've been down to our, our, our residence in Los Angeles a few times. And they've worked with all kinds of global stars, as you can see here. They financed over 40 major films in the last two years. So um, while these are big success stories, um, success outside of Canada is important. Um, it isn't a case of us offshoring jobs. It's just that we don't have enough people here. So whatever we can do to grow these industries globally and grow in the United States is a positive thing. Um, and it's with peak TV and people sort of streaming it in when they want, it's important that we create content and it's important that our content learns how to export. 
And so what we do, the consulate role and our consulate's role in film and television, um, we have a cultural mandate. So Canadian values are inherent in our cultural productions and deserve to be shared with the world. Um, so we have a creative export strategy that the current government has launched and we're, we're helping make happen. We make connections by bringing people together on a daily basis, um, both at our consulate and at our residence, and, and really try and set the conditions for doing business. And most Canadian companies in the space are small and medium-sized enterprises, so they don't really know how to navigate on the ground, meaning they, they come to Los Angeles, it's so big, they want to meet with a studio executive, it's like, you know, good luck. But if we actually reach out and sort of put it together and create unique events, it happens. And I've got numerous cases and examples of that happening since we've been there. Um, this is just one example. This was only three weeks ago. Um, we worked with the Canadian media producers to bring down 20 Canadian producers to LA to meet with development executives at studio production companies. And w w two guys, were, I sat with these guys at lunch and they're from Vancouver and they said, you know, we've got a TV series. I'm a former uh, military pilot and I'm actually going around finding planes that have been shot down around the world that are never reported about. It's like looking at um, sunken ships. And they said to me, we would never ever, I, I pitched this idea to people who think we're crazy, but we have five meetings as a result of this event coming down and we really think this, this is going to get picked up by somebody. And again, they couldn't have got the meetings without us. Um, just another example, um, with Disney, uh, we've got creative animation companies into the room to pitch them show co uh, concepts again that probably would not have happened. Um, and we use the resonance. Again, for those of you who haven't been there, it's a, an amazing, uh, beautiful building in the middle of Hancock Park that we use to host people. This was last year's Academy Award event um, and really was a, a great event for us to communicate who we are. Again, the small and medium-sized companies getting an invitation to something like this, they're thrilled to be here. Um, the uh, gentlemen on the left were nominated for Academy Awards for breadwinner um, Canadians um, that was involved, Angel Angelina Jolie was involved with. So that was a great event. And then of course, um, the, I'm gonna reference the Emmy event. This Sunday night, we're going back to Los Angeles. We have 150 plus people coming to the residence, including 50 Canadians who have been nominated for Emmy Awards, which is really amazing when you think about it. A lot of these people aren't in front of the, in front of the screen, but they're people that are doing tremendous work, and many of them are coming, and they will be there with their families as we celebrate them the night before the Emmy Awards on Sunday night. And we will do this in conjunction with ACRA, uh, Telefilm, the Talent Fund. Many of you are in the room today. This was another thing, a very creative idea that our staff came up with. We work with local publications. This is Variety Magazine. We pitched them the idea of, we've done two things with them in the last two years. One was the top 10 Canadians to watch, and we actually put this together, so they hosted, they put them in their magazine one, and these are young people that are obviously growing their careers uh, in film and television, um, and Variety hosted an event for us at the house. We also did a billion dollar production event with Variety Magazine where they um, came in and we had people from Toronto, Vancouver into the house to talk about the size and scope of TV and film production in Canada. This of course is my namesake, uh, the great Denis Villeneuve. Um, and he's just an interesting person. I sat with him at this lunch and he's now top five director in Hollywood in, in tremendous demand, just did uh, Blade Runner, um, other remakes. And he talks about the system in Canada that supported and nurtured him to get him to where he is. He said, look, I couldn't have figured out this craft on my own. People would have laughed at me. I'm from rural Quebec. So it took him a, you know, a sort of a 20-year period to get where he is. Um, and he's one of these people that's very generous of his time in Hollywood with Canadians that are down there. And he meets with people all the time at our request. Um, and this is good. So now I'm shifting back to Canada. So we're coming back to Canada as things are going on. Um, last month, for the first time ever, more American films were shot in Canada than anywhere else, and of the top 100 grosses, top grossing box office films in, 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 shot in the world, 20 were made in Canada, so basically 20% in a country our size, and growing. And there's reasons for that in terms of why this is happening and why this is popular. And one is our sponsor. Um, when you build studios, um, they're full. I went out to Pinewood yesterday, I was telling Randy at lunch, uh, it really is amazing. Every single stage is full, um, and full for years out, and 
massive expansion plans that are coming with Bell's involvement with Pinewood. Um, again, building footprint and, and the system on the ground is just great and will continue to go on. And I was chairman of a board called TEDCO back 20 years ago. Jeff Steiner is here, it was the CEO. And we were the boards that actually got this studio built. And at the time, it, it was a real tough slog to get that off the ground through a city agency, but now it's built and happening and more to come. So it's just great having it there. It was great seeing it. Vancouver, same thing. Um, it is, uh, if anybody's been to Vancouver recently, you, it's impossible not to see film crews on the streets. It's just full and packed. And we have lots of our personal friends in Los Angeles who are either in Toronto or Vancouver on a regular basis um, just coming in and out because that's where they work, right? And they're asking us about the cities all the time. So it's big business, 1.6 billion, 322,000 jobs. Um, and getting into why this is happening, let me just touch on a couple of things. Tax incentives, without a doubt, are very important to the mix. And they're quite simple to understand. <laughs> um, but basically how it works is Ontario offers a 21% rebate on qualified qualifying productions. So let's suppose you spend a million dollars. Um, you're eligible for $215,000 uh, in rebates. On top of that, there's a federal tax credit. You combine that in of 16%, you can see why it's important. Um, and tax credits are constantly up for discussion with new governments um, and old governments because it's the kind of thing where it's very hard to predict. You know, the treasurer of the province wants to sit down and say, well, what are we spending on this in a given year? And, you know, they'll allocate a number. The number could be much higher if you get more production. It could be less. So it's a tricky thing, and that balance between sort of the creative side of the business and the financial side of the business. But if we don't have it, it this will, these numbers won't look like they do. Um, and again, it's risky business. So if, if a producer can line up the incentives in advance, it can help them get investors and literally take the, banking, uh, take the financing to the bank for, for um, financing. And of course, that's why the incentives matter, is that you get the financing, and, but it's competitive. I can tell you in the United States right now, uh, you know, when New Orleans comes to Los Angeles, and I highlight that because that's a place where there's a lot of activity, the governor comes, the mayor comes, Brad Pitt hosts the event, like it's a big, big deal in terms of what they do. And you've got competitive centers in the United States, Atlanta, New Orleans, Los Angeles, back in the game in a big way, and some global centers like Prague and others. Um, so it's important for us to keep that in mind that it's, it's this business can move in different places if it wants to. But, as was just men mentioned uh, with our royal family member here now, people love Toronto. Like one of the pluses we have here is everything that you represent, right? The great parts of living in this city and what it means. Um, the quality of life, if you have to move up here, the schools are great. Um, any sort of health care education. Uh, when Minister Freeland came down, our foreign affairs minister was with us uh, two years ago. We had a group of very senior executives meet with her and they were basically replaying, re talking back to her just of how good it was to be here but how we need to continue to move forward. Um, so again, I don't think it's the kind of thing that we take for granted, but we need to stay on it. I'll highlight one thing, pre-clearance at airports. Think about what that means when you go to Pearson and you clear, or you go to Billy Bishop, and you don't have to land at LAX with the 20,000 other people that are in line. So that, and that's not a right. That's not something that's enshrined in the Constitution. We have to work at that with our United States partners all the time. But it makes it a lot easier for people to get in and out and do business, so we have to always pay attention to that. Our friends from Air Canada are here, and there's eight flights a day, and I use them all the time, so that's as super positive as this WestJet. We don't pick favorites, but... Um, <laughs> and then you get the outstanding technicians, artisans, and crews. When a project is made here, it's quite frequently employs local production. I saw them yesterday uh, at Pinewood. Uh, we have people here that have won Oscars, Emmys, that live here, that participate in everything. Um, and it's an absolute selling point and an attraction for who we are and what we do and what the industry means here. Plus, you can make this place look like other places, which I'm sure when you live in Toronto and if you've spent any time here, if you watch any type of movies or television, you're going, that's not, you know, the Miracle Mile in Chicago. That's Young and Eglinton. Like, we know that. 
but it's a great thing to be able to cater and craft the city to look the way it, want, it looks. Um, and, uh, you know, and people here are part of that. I mean, John Tory and I have talked about this, Mayor Tory, um, and he's been great. Uh, we've had to call him on things. People say, what's his involvement with this? I said, well, if the street needs to be closed or something needs to be done, his office dives in on it, right? And that just with a studio executive in Hollywood, it's like, you know, your mayor is great. He really helped make things happen. So that's an important part of who we are. Um, you know, we make it look like Gotham City. And then, of course, we can do futuristic. I think I saw that guy on Young Street last night. But, um, and anyway, this is part of what we do with the official residents is to have the studios understand this and, and understand what they can get and how they uh, can use us. And this is an example of one. This is one of the better calls I've had in the last four and a half years. Get a phone call from a very senior executive at Warner Brothers says, James, we've got a real problem. I said, what's the problem? He goes, well, we took a bunch of bazookas and cannons down to Buffalo, New York to film part of Suicide Squad. Pretty easy to bring them into the U.S., I guess. And then he said, but then we had to try and bring them back into Canada. And they're like, yeah, you can't bring that stuff in here. So at least our border people are doing the stopping the guns coming in. Um, so because it's a federal agency that regulates the border, we were able to, and they were telling us this is going to cost us $400,000 a day if we can't get them in. So we were able to extradite this, and we got it, all this stuff in in a day. But that's the kind of call that if they didn't know who to call, right, it would be like, how do we deal with this? They would have called some, somebody in Ottawa and probably been tossed to, you know, Border Patrol in Buffalo and guns would still be there. You've also got, um, you know, how do the incentives play out in the best case scenario? You probably know Shape of Water, was obviously filmed here. Uh, and that happened because Guillermo de Toro uh, and his Canadian production partner, Miles Dale, who has been down with us many times, had a positive experience with other projects here. So as they've had a good experience, like, well, maybe we just keep this going. They want to shoot Shape of Water here so they could use the same stages and crews they had on Strain. Um, Del Toro adopted Toronto as his home and really does want to work here. He doesn't want to go anywhere else. He wants to work here if it's, if it's made available to him. And now, um, and this is Dale's comment, which basically he said, look, all in all, our experience here was so good um, with all of the support around this that we want to keep using Canada and have things in Canada. Our top people are here, and it was by and large a Canadian production, which is great. So what happens? You put down roots, and our roots now for this industry are pretty thick and deep in Canada. So it's not the kind of thing that we have to start from scratch, but like any tree, you need to nurture it and continue to grow it to make sure that it's sustainable. Um, tax in, in, uh, incentives are part of it, uh, but you've also got just the other parts that go along with this. Um, this is one I love. I'm going to just talk a bit about talent. So this is Coco, um, a big Disney film. And this was a Seneca grad who developed this character, a grandmother from Pixar. Uh, Pixar is one of those places that's loaded with Seneca, Seneca grads. Seneca, Georgia, Georgian Brown, uh, Ryerson. Ryerson comes down every year in an exchange with UCLA. And the UCLA students come up here, and we've had them at our house a few times. And the UCLA students said to me after coming to Ryerson, I wish our facilities were like this. Like, they're raving about Toronto and Canada and what we have here. So don't forget that is part of the ecosystem. And I give credits to our post-secondary education that we're feeding and creating people to fill these jobs. And it's important that we do that. And the schools are oversubscribed. Um, we had Premier Wind down uh, a year ago. And the students were saying, you've got to get more people in and out of these schools. Nice problem to have, right? Especially if young people that are looking for work, you should think about these schools. Of course. Um, the visual effects is another thing that Canada is taking a leading role in, um, and it's, it's something that we're developing critical e expertise in different cities, both Montreal here and Vancouver. And it's the kind of thing that you know, the future of, of film, much of it is going to be done in this way. So the more that we can you know, participate in this, the better it is for us in the long run. Intellectual property. Now, you may not think of Anne of Green Gables as intellectual property, but it's literally seen around the world. And if you've been to Prince Edward Island, you'll see young Japanese girls there wanting to see where Anne of Green Gables lives. So this is an intellectual property that's produced in Canada that's pushed around the world, so a good part of our Canadian culture. 
We're also producing all kinds of other programs. There's just demand for creative activity that's happening. Um, and everything from Letter Kenny to others that I, 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 the other day, I'm walking down the street in Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, and I hear two guys talking about Letter Kenny. And they're like 16 year old Angelinos, right? And I've never seen it. So I'm like, I got back and said, I got to watch this because they were talking about Hockey Canada and this little town. So that's the kind of IP that if we keep producing and pitching it out, we're going to have great success with that. This is another thing. Um, you know, how do you keep this going? And this is pretty amazing that um, we actually now have three of the largest children's shows in the world. And if you're down there and anybody has kids of that age, you'll know this, that, you know, Paw Patrol being a global um, sort of thing with merchandise that extends far beyond anything that you can imagine in terms of what it's done. Um, E1 uh, picking up some of this, these pieces as they expand them around the world. Um, so again, a level of experience in Canada to push things out. The other part about these um, cart cartoons, basically what they are, is that um, we have language skills here and we have cultural skills that understand that this will play well if you add to this in a China, in a Russia, in a Ukraine, and wherever you want to do it. Uh, the other one referenced here is Peppa the Pig, which is a $1.1 billion um, pr uh, basically enterprise right now. Um, but there are potential risks to this um, in kids' television, partially due to the fact that Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, and others platforms, um, there's restrictions on advertising in terms of what they can or can't do. So some of this content is being delivered on uh, these vehicles, and it's a changing industry, and people are always trying to figure out, especially when it involves children, how do you regulate that, how do you understand what that means and, and what's going on. So we need to be very uh, aware of that. Um, and the other thing, just to mention NAFTA for a second, because it's, you know, our cultural industries um, are part of NAFTA. It's not, um, and I was on a call two days ago on this, it's not that this is a burning platform in NAFTA, but it's not something that we can take lightly that it doesn't get into the mix as one of the categories that people want to talk about. And I've said to people in Ottawa, Steve Mnuchin, who is um, the Treasury Secretary, um, he's a Hollywood guy. His wife's an actress. He understands full well how the system works here. Um, not that there's anything to be uh, that we should apologize for, but in the current environment, we just have to be very aware of this and make sure that we're managing it. Um, you know, part of it would be we want to make sure that we continue to grow local talent and we have systems in place to help do that, uh, but we have to be wary of it. Um, and then this is something that people say to me every day, or as, a, as in Canada, you know, you're producing this Canadian content and there's this dual-edged sword between, you know, is it making money, is it profitable, are people around the world going to buy this, uh, it's only on CBC, why should we be doing this, versus our ability to develop cultural talent. So the fact that we're able, as a small country, able to develop people that can build their skills to try and grow. And not everyone's going to do it. Like, we're going to have people that are going to try and... Uh, you know, may not succeed in this industry, and we're going to have lots that will. And some are going to have working careers where they work in the industry forever, but they're not Denis Villeneuve, but they make a great living at it. And so that's something that we I, we believe that we've got to continue to support, and as as Canadians and as the government of Canada. Um, another thing, just to mention this, um, in Los Angeles, there was quite a debate a few years ago about runaway productions. So I just showed you the amount of films being produced, the big budget films being produced in Canada. Well, some people don't like that, right? Especially if you're in the industry in Los Angeles and, and other parts of the United States where they're saying, you know, we're not sure we want that going on. Why is our government not fighting back? We don't think that it's a they lose, we win sort of thing. And that's what, what we tell politicians, that there's enough room to grow the pie for everybody. And we're witnessing more of that now. Um, and so we make a real strong effort of communicating um, the value to Angelinos in terms of work that's being done here. And we have all kinds of systems and sort of statistics that we communicate that on a very regular basis. We see the mayor on an ongoing basis in terms of this is what's happening here and how we can work together. So it's not, uh, but it does come up occasionally. Um, you know, you worry about a brain drain out of the country, too. This is Jay Baruchel. He's got a heart tattooed on his, his chest. Um, you know, 
part of this is that he's a Canadian who wants to continue to do well and grow here, and that's something that we want to continue to support. Um, another part of the, in the forefront is virtual reality. And so there's a company called Felix and Paul out of Montreal, and they're really something else. They have created virtual reality products. They've been doing work with LeBron James. They've been doing work with um, some of the presidential candidates in terms of VR and what is VR going to mean to the future. And they're leading edge on this, and people are coming to them to see how they're doing. They're Montreal-based. Um, they're continuing to grow, and that's the kind of expertise that we should continue to develop because the world is headed in this direction, and if we can have a lot of this um, based in Canada, it would be great. Um, so somebody would say to me, you know, what's a French film look like? Maybe it looks a little like this, walking down the streets in Paris, having a, smoking a cigarette. Uh, you obviously know that's France. But we have a bit of a different advantage or opportunity. And this one, I, I remember, I've seen this, and I talked, I'll tell you what it is, because you may or not have seen this, but um, this is a, a Pixar short called Boa, and it played before Incredibles 2. So if you had kids of that age and you went to Incredibles 2, you saw this. And this is a Sheridan, Sheridan College graduate that did this. Her name is uh, Domini Shi. She's a Chinese Canadian. Um, and she told a story about, through this character, of her immigration and family uh, to Canada. Um, and if you see it, it's very touching and heartwarming. Um, and that sort of is one of the advantages we have. Um, you know, we've got people here from all over the world that are accepted, that grow, that come here to embrace who we are, and they can tell stories about that, and stories that will resonate around the world. So we should really celebrate that as part of who we are. Um, and this is part of what the Prime Minister is talking about when he, when he references our, our cultural values and who we are. It's something we should use as an advantage every single day and embrace, and, and believe me, the world uh, you know, we're not perfect, that's for sure, but people do look at Canada as a place of, of opportunity and growth, and people in the creative industries in particular look at this place and go, wow, you've got a lot of good things going. So we need to continue to foster that growth, support the people that are doing the business, and, and move it forward. And everyone in this room can play a role in that, participate in that. That's it. I want to thank you. Um, the Prime Minister's asking me where I get my hair done in Los Angeles. I had to <laughs> point that out. It's a bit of the reverse. Um, thank you. So James has agreed to uh, take a couple of questions uh, from the audience, and we have two mics available, one from uh, Bill over here and Marie over there. If you could please uh, introduce yourself in, in the organization you're from prior to asking your question, that would make it uh, better for our Council General. Uh, Garo Karasteshi, Fuse Marketing. Hello, James. Um, you talked about how a lot of small, business, small businesses in, in California um, so whether it's in this industry or in others, where we're knocking on the door of America, where we see it as a large opportunity, how do we access uh, Canadian government support um, and, and what is there available for companies like ours, small to medium businesses? Uh, thanks, Sarah. It's a good question. Um, we have 12 consulates across the United States and consulates around the world, <laughs> embassies or consulates. Uh, we have the Trade Commissioner Service works in our consulates. So if you just look up the consulate, you'll see the name, uh, call, ask for the Trade Commissioner. Uh, we work very hard to make sure you'll get a call back. Not everyone is going to get the support they want because we're trying to focus in certain sectors and industries. So somebody may call and say, I really want to do this. But our Trade Commissioner Service also does a good job at screening people. So they would talk to you about your company saying exactly what do you want to do, what's your focus, how do you want to grow, are you export ready if you're exporting something? Because some people say, yeah, I really want to launch everything in California, I'm a fruit juice company, and they can't supply you know, Vancouver. Well, guess what, you're, you're not at the stage where you're ready to do that. Um, but that's the services available, and again, it's the uh, Trade Commissioner Service, and here's the best part, it's free. And we're one of the few countries in the world that doesn't charge for that service. So it, it's, it's worth your while making a phone call if you want to try and export and grow your business. 
Hi, I'm Bill Skolnick with the Directors Guild of Canada in Ontario. We, we've met. Uh, you graciously uh, let me into your office one day. Um, I have a question about, uh, about NAFTA, about the fact that some of us have been in an advisory capacity on cultural affairs with the government. And for the past couple of years, or ever since it began, they've been, we've been told, and I think rightfully so, that the cultural exemption has not been an issue. A couple of weeks ago, out of the blue, to all of us, it became an issue. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, it's NAFTA period. We're in a, you know, we're in a delicate, tough place, right? Um, I will give our credit, uh, government credit. Uh, Mr. Freeland is, I've met her a few times now, um, is, is driving an agenda in a very difficult situation to try and protect the things we value, yet our economy with 70% of it tied to the United States is we, we have to get an after deal uh, or some form of it. Uh, cultural industries are not high on the list. I mean, I, I'm giving this as from a conversation two days ago. So things can change every day in this file because you're in a game of we're prepared to give on this, we don't want to give on this, right? And so people are, and I, Mr. Freeman left and she's in Regina today meeting with the Prime Minister to go through the next steps. I don't think they're going to hit because it, it really hasn't been something that's been front and center. But again, with the current administration, till the deal's done, you're never sure. So, but I continue to echo and articulate the, the way we avoid this is that people really understand how important it is to Canada. And part of these sort of presentations are what we need to keep telling people, that it's not something you just throw out, right? Because we do, we're not getting it back. So. I'd like to invite Rainy Lennox, uh, president of Bell Media, to, to uh, come and speak with us. James, I was asked today to just um, say a few words on behalf of Pinewood Toronto Studios. Um, those of us at Bell Media are entering the content world and, and we're proud to say that Letter Kenny is our show and that Cardinal is our show that's picked up in the US with Hulu in partnership with E1. So we're, as we develop that business, we've just recently acquired Pinewood Studios and um, are expanding that to really have a footprint here in Toronto to invite all the Hollywood studios and our own Canadian content providers to, to make films here. So hopefully that adds to the economy of Toronto and the country. And I just want to thank you because you have been, uh, since you've taken this role in 2014, an absolute cultural champion of Canada. And you have been extraordinary in your sort of perseverance of helping all of us in Los Angeles where it really does happen and taking those borders down for us, those, the, those of us that are trying to get content, as you've just said, extrapolated in the U.S. So I just, on behalf of everyone at Bell Media and Pinewood, I wanted to, we wanted to participate today because first off, he's a great guy. <laughs> and second off, he's a great champion for Canadian content, so that's appreciated. Thank you. Please join us at our next event on the schedule, the Fresh Faces of, Politi uh, of Provincial Politics panel, and that's September 18th. We also have Ontario's new Attorney General, uh, Caroline Mulroney, speaking on October 9th, and that will be posted on the website by the end of the week. So thank you very much for coming and for joining us today. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.